Hi everyone, welcome to the second in our series of video blogs on adverse childhood experiences. Um, last video blog, we spoke to you a little bit about what childhood ex adverse childhood experiences are and the impact that they have on both adults and children. We also gave you a little bit of information on how it might impact the brain. This time, we're going to give you a little bit more information on how we can minimize the impact of adverse childhood experiences. Back with us today is Laurie Norman of the Strengthening Families of the Brazos Valley, and we will talk a little bit more about what adverse childhood experiences are, and then go on to give you a little bit more information about trauma-informed care. Great. So Laurie, what are adverse childhood experiences? If you could just repeat that a little bit sure. for our audience. So adverse childhood experiences are traumatic, events that happen during childhood. And it can range anything from all kinds of abuse or neglect to having uh, parents who are divorced or having a parent who is incarcerated or not feeling safe or loved in your household. Um, and then the effects of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are linked to all kinds of both mental health and physical health problems um, for the children as they're experiencing them and then also for adults as we get older um, they're linked with chronic health disease, mental health disorders, behavioral disorders of, of all kinds. So it, um, it, it sounds to me you've had some personal experiences of working with people of, or come across people who have experienced ACEs. Um, I've, I've heard you tell a story and I'd really like you to tell that story again to our audience today okay. on uh, what you've actually experienced um, in, in people that you've met. Absolutely. Experiences. Right. And, and so like we talked about last time, about 64% of the adult population of the United States most likely has it, at least one adverse childhood experiences. And unfortunately, many of us have more than that. Um, before the role that I have now, I was a parent educator um, here at Extension. I had a, a program that pr just focused on parenting classes. Um, and in the course of that work, I um, met a girl, a young woman, who was 16 at the time that I met her, who was taking my parenting class in order to get custody of her son back. Um, she was 16. He was nearly two um, when I met her. She was 16, close to 17. And so we started meeting just one-on-one. -on -one and um, I, I had met her because she was associated with our church because she was living in a safe house for victims of human trafficking. Um, as I got to know her and found her story, um, uh, it, it's just amazing and appalling and um, it just very, very sad and, and her outcomes could have been much different than what they were and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But anyway, she grew up in the valley in South Texas, uh, close to the border. Both of her parents worked for a drug cartel. Um, I don't know what they did, but um, her mom is currently in prison. Um, and so she grew up kind of in that environment. When she was 12 years old, her mother decided that she wanted a new truck and started pimping her out when she was 12. Um, she would service six to eight men a night, um, and that went on for a couple of years. She ended up pregnant, which is the child that, you know, she's trying to get custody back. And um, so I think she had him when she was about 14 and a half, between 14 and a half and 15. Um, also during that time period, her father made his bosses angry. And so they took him and her um, into Mexico and they executed him in front of her and then basically said she would be doing his job now. And that if she didn't, they would kill her grandmother and her brothers. She had several younger brothers. And so she comes back to Texas and she starts trafficking drugs for the cartel um, across the border, back and forth between um, Texas and Mexico. Um, still also being trafficked by her mother. And um, she herself starts doing drugs. Um, she tries to commit suicide a couple of times, but doesn't. Um, after she gets pregnant, um, she decides she wants to stay alive because she's gonna have this child. But again, she's still working for the cartel. She's still working for her mom. Um, and then what happens is that she gets picked up um, coming back across the border from Mexico one time um, and has drugs on her. And so she gets arrested and she goes to jail. Um, she doesn't tell anyone in law enforcement what's actually going on. 
And so they take her to trial and the district attorney in the area like I said she's 15 years old, wants to make an example out of her and wants to try her as an adult, as an international drug trafficker. 15 and a half year old girl um, who really felt like she had no other option except for to be doing that. But again, she's too terrified to tell anyone her actual story because there in her town, if she had started talking, it would have gotten out. So they go to her hearing, um, her arraignment, you know, to set up, you know, what the charges are gonna be and everything. And the DA is pushing to try her as an adult um, to make an example out of her. And um, her grandmother's in the courtroom with her son, who's a baby. And the judge, for whatever reason, was just moved by compassion for her and said, no, we're not gonna try this girl as an adult. We're gonna try her as a child. Um, and so that's what they did. And she was sentenced to a juvenile detention facility. Um, and that's where we're gonna stop for the moment. Um, she was very, very fortunate that she had the judge who just out of his own, like I said, compassion, decided not to do what the DA was saying. Um, however, if the legal and justice system in that town had been more trauma informed, they might have been able to get her help much sooner than what she eventually got it. It's always a difficult story to hear, but um, you use the words trauma informed. Yes. Would you tell us a little bit more about what does that mean? What does being trauma informed mean and uh, what does it entail? Sure. So the ACEs research that we talked about last time started in the mid 90s. Um, out of that research has grown up several other areas of research, one of them being people just asking the question, if this is the state of our people, that two thirds of them have experienced childhood trauma and are struggling in their lives because of it, what can we do to help that? I mean, what can we do both to stop it from happening to children, but what can we do to help the adults who've already experienced it? And so what has grown out of that is a movement called tra being trauma-informed or trauma-informed care. And what trauma-informed care does is it emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety, not only for the victim, but also for the provider. Um, a lot of times as providers, um, we can get very caught up in the trauma of the people we're trying to help. And so being trauma-informed tries to protect the safety of both parties. And um, it really, more than anything, is a mind shift away from what is wrong with this person to what has this person been through or what is this person's story. Um, so instead of just looking at the person and saying, well, this person is an addict or this person is a criminal, uh, they may very well be those things, but there's usually a lot more to it on how they got to that point. And let's look at that and see if we can't help them deal with those things in their past so that they can move forward to be productive um, in our society. So. Um what is, when, when you start to set out to become trauma-informed, what does that mean? Okay, well there's several things um, to become trauma-informed that kind of take places at different levels of an organization. Um, so there's systemic, like the overreaching part of an organization, and then also the relational part between the provider and the person that they're working with. And then also personal changes within the providers themselves to help them remain that way. So the first thing that um, we really want to, I guess, avoid in dealing with trauma victims is re-traumatizing them. Um, and this can look like a lot of different things. But at the systemic organizational level, um, things like having to continually retell their story can re-traumatize them. And so, for example, what I think of um, is in the, in, in, in the case of rape, say you have a teenage girl who is raped and she goes and tells her parents um, and they call the police and then she tells the police and then they take her to medical services and she has to tell the medical providers and then maybe she has to tell her attorney and then eventually if it goes to trial she may have to tell it again in court. It, in every retelling there is the potential to re-traumatize the victim. Um, not just, you know, more than just the, the common, well, this is kind of upsetting or whatever, but to actually make them relive the initial trauma. 
So, you know, if organizations could find ways to share information, to um, not insist on a retelling every time something has happened, uh, it, it's a good way to, to avoid re-traumatizing victims. Um, another thing that can be very traumatic for someone who's experienced ACEs um, is being treated as a number. Um, and the way I think about this, the most obvious thing is um, last year I had to go renew my driver's license. I go out to DPS and literally you are just a number. You go stand in line to sign in. They give you a number. Then you go sit in these chairs all facing the same way. They eventually call your number and you're treated like a number throughout the whole process. Um, nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. Um, but for someone who has been, you know, really traumatized, that can give them such a feeling of powerlessness that it can be very, very intimidating. Um, doctor's offices can sometimes be like that, where you're not really seen as a person, you're just seen as the patient. And we've got to hurry up, I've got so many people I have to see today, we got to get you in, get you out. And you just feel sort of like, you know, cattle being pushed through the, the process. And I, that can just really make a, um, a victim who may be struggling um, feel like they have no control over their environment, to feel like they don't matter, that they're not worthy, and that can cause re-traumatization. Um, the other thing I mentioned just briefly a second ago um, is being seen as their label. You know, you are an addict, you are a delinquent, you are a troublemaker if you're dealing with kids, um, with adults, you know, you are unemployed, you are, you know, a criminal, whatever it may be. Um, you can't hold down a job. You can't maintain a relationship. Just all of the, the negative things that we um, see in the people a lot of times that we're dealing with. Um, you know, you suffer from mental illness, so you're depressed. You know, you're schizophrenic. You're, you know, you have PTSD, and that's the sum of who you are. Um, being able to see past that um, is much better. If all you see is the label and that's the only way you relate to that person, then that can be very traumatic for them. Um, the other thing is that um, if the people that we work with don't have a choice in what's going on, even if those things are being done for them. So let's say someone comes in for counseling for whatever reason and the therapist is very much adamant about this is what we need to do, this is how we need to do it, this is the course that's going to be best for you, or even in a doctor in a medical situation. Um, not being given any kind of choice or say in what's being done to them or for them, again, it just reinforces those feelings of powerlessness, um, of not having control over their environment, uh, and of not being worthy of having a voice, and again, can cause re-traumatization. Um, and kind of linked with that is not having the opportunity to give feedback about their experience. Um, and I think about this sometimes when we've dealt with uh, like probation officers and counselors within that system. Um, a lot of times you look at probationers or offenders, well you just have to do what I tell you to do, you toe the line, and it doesn't really matter how I treat you because you're the bad guy. And then, so the offender or the probationer not having a way to go to someone and say, hey, my counselor is really bad, you know, or my counselor is really good, or whatever, but just not having that opportunity to give feedback in some way, again, increases those feelings of not having control, um, not having a voice, and can be very traumatic. And those kind of institutional things are what will keep people sometimes from seeking help, will keep them away from their doctors, will keep them from trying to find maybe a counselor or a therapist, or even, um, you know, getting any kind of assistance. It might prevent them because they feel so intimidated by, I'm only going to be seen as this, and I'm going to be treated, you know, like a number, and no one is going to listen to me. And unfortunately, even in, um, you know, sectors that their whole existence is to help people, it's really easy to fall into some of these patterns at the organizational level because you're also trying to see all the people you have to see. You're trying to deal efficiently and get things done. And so um, there just needs to be a balance and actually hearing the person that you're working with as well. Um, on the relational level, or did you have a question? No, I was just thinking about the fact that 
that's why it's probably more helpful to think of a trauma-informed environment versus just expecting the service provider to be trauma-informed on the individual level. Exactly. Because if they're only providing it on the individual level and it isn't consistent through the rest of the environment, then the effects or the benefits of it would be lost. Well, and, and you can get very mixed signals then. Yeah. And um, I know that um, we have, uh, in dealing with, say, juvenile services, we had a, a counselor in juvenile services give us an example of something just like that. Um, the counselor had had a really good session with um, their um you know, it's a teenage offender, and um, had really felt like they'd make some progress. The, the The kid was just happy, was really excited about what they'd done. They get to the end of the session, open the door, the probation officer is standing there, and just begins to slam them about something they missed with probation. And so all of the good that had just been done with the counselor was pretty much undone because the probation officer was so focused on, this is what you did wrong. And so, yes, those changes have to be at the organizational level, um, but they have to be relational as well. Um, the person has to feel like whoever they're dealing with really does see them and is listening to them. They have to feel like they can trust that person um, and that that trust isn't going to be violated. And th I see this even with teachers and students. Um, you know, don't make promises you can't keep. And if something happens where you have to change something, Give an explanation as to why. Um, making sure that there's emotional safety, you know, that the person feels safe in your presence. Um, giving them the opportunity to collaborate, like I said a minute ago, not having a choice. So make sure that you have some uh, areas that they can collaborate, give feedback. Another thing is not doing things for them, but doing things with them or helping them do for themselves. Um, sometimes, just as caregivers, it's like, well, one, it's so much easier if I just do it myself, but two, I feel so passionately about helping you, I'm just going to do this for you. Um, and again, that just reinforces those feelings of powerlessness, which most victims feel very, very strongly. Um, the other relational um, issues as far as re-traumatization is using punitive treatment, coercive practices, and oppressive language, which we've actually hit on several of those. But for punitive treatment, um, even like in families with parents, when parents discipline their children way out of um, balance with what the child actually did, or when a school punishes a child, that something is you know, way out of balance for what they did. Or even in the case of the young woman I mentioned, wanting to try her as an adult, even though she was a 15-year-old child, without looking at her circumstances is punitive. The coercive practices, trying to sort of manipulate people into doing what you want them to do. And then oppressive language, again, the labeling, the talking down to, those sorts of things. All of those things can um, cause re-traumatization in the people that you're actually trying to help. So um, are there specific things that the service providers can do then to ensure that the the care that they provide is trauma-informed? Absolutely, there's, there's several things. And the first level is just environmental changes, meaning the way your atmosphere, you know, your office to whatever degree you can. Um, so creating safety, areas that are calm and comfortable, that feel safe. Um, so teachers in classrooms, you know, I know that there's been a lot of changes in the way classrooms are set up in recent years. I have kids in school and it's way different than when I was a kid. Uh, most of them have couches or, you know, safe areas or whatever that kids can go to if they're feeling out of sorts or stressed or whatever. Um, so just trying to create an environment with whatever space you have that is welcoming, that is calming, where the person coming to you can feel safe where they can feel like um, that they're in a, in a good place that they feel comfortable in. So that's the one thing, just how it looks, how it's set up. Um, the other thing is giving them that choice, you know, providing options. E even if you're offering, um, you know, therapy, give them choices on what they think will work best, how they want to proceed, what they want to do first. Um, if it's in a medical environment, so maybe there's not a lot of choices for how to treat this particular thing, but at least really walk them through the process to make sure that they understand it and make sure that they feel like they're being heard. Um, empowerment, meaning noticing their capabilities. Um, 
uh, I always think about, again, our probation officers and those sorts of things, um, and teachers having to deal with unruly students. Um, sometimes it's hard to notice someone's capabilities when they've, they're there because they've done wrong or because they're that person that just pushes your buttons and annoys you to no end all the time. Um, but look for their strengths. Look at what they can do well. Um, when they make a successful choice, when they, when they complete something, really celebrate that. Um, one of the examples for teachers I like to give is say, you have a student who does really poorly on a test because you know, they don't pay attention in class and they don't do their homework or whatever, um, but they've drawn a tremendous picture on the test. Well, you can talk to them about how they need to study more or do better in class. But you could also draw attention to the fact that that was a really awesome picture and have they thought of pursuing art. So just little things like that. Um, again, when they make one good decision, celebrate that. And the more you praise someone for the positive they do, the more of those positive things will come. Um, being collaborative, making decisions together, again, that goes hand in hand with choice. Um, a, a lot of the things, um, it's, it's kind of a buzzword nowadays is, is social contracts, you know, getting people to buy into what you're wanting them to do. Social contract is just an agreement between people, you know, this is how we're going to behave, this is how we're going to react to one another, um, but it comes from, from both parties. So teachers do it with their students. What do we want the class rules to be? And the students give the rules and the teacher says what she wants, and then they all go together to say this is how we're going to behave. Um, it works with adults as well. And when you have the adults or the kids building the rules, they're way more apt to follow them. So any kind of collaborative effort is very empowering to someone who's been traumatized. Um, another thing really, really important is being trustworthy. Being that person that they know they can trust. Being there when you say you're going to be there. Following through on the things you say you're going to follow through on. Um, like I said a minute ago, not making promises you can't keep. Don't, you know, say you're a counselor. Um, you know, don't tell people things like, hey, once we get through these sessions I want to do, your life is going to be great. I mean, it, it may not be. But say, you can make improvements, you know, you can make things better. If it's a teacher, you know, don't promise your kids that everything's going to be super if they just do well in this class, because that's not true. You know, so be careful with your words and what you say and be trustworthy. And again, if something happens where you have to for legal reasons or circumstances out of your control, sort of violate that bond, make sure you explain to them why and, um, and, and try to rebuild that trust. Trust is hard to get from people who've been traumatized. And once it's broken, it's very, very difficult to regain. Um, the last thing for environmental changes and um, really I feel like this is the thing that holds all the rest of it up and really holds all of trauma informed up and that's just respect. Respecting the people that you work with, respecting the people um, that you encounter every day. Treating everyone as though they're an individual who is worthy of your time and your effort. Um, and I understand that sometimes that can be really difficult depending on what sector you work in, depending on how the person is behaving at the moment. Um, and so I tell people if all you can do is respect them because they're a human being and they happen to be on planet Earth with you, well then start there. You know, at the very core basis of the fact that we're both humans and I can respect you for that. Um, but then as you grow in your relationship with them, start looking for capabilities, start looking for the good and increase your respect. Um, I've never seen an instance of someone who's treated respectfully that they don't eventually give that respect back. Whether it's a child or an adult, if you treat someone with respect, then they will eventually, in turn, give you the same respect back. So if you go back to the, um, the instance of the young lady that you worked with, mm -hmm. um, what impact did you see of her? Um, did the ACEs minimize the impact? Was the impact of her ACEs minimized because of the trauma-informed care she received? Well, eventually, yes. So we kind of left off with her in court. Um, the judge deciding not to send a try, her, try her as an adult. And so she did get sentenced for you know, some kind of drug charge. 
and sent to a juvenile detention facility, but it was considerably away from where she grew up. Um, when she got into that facility, she um, started having nightmares, really, really bad nightmares. She started trying to commit suicide. Um, and one person in that juvenile detention facility had been trained to recognize the signs of someone who had been human trafficked. One person. And she recognized those signs in this young woman and started talking to her started hearing the story that I told you and really started making um, you know a move on her behalf to get her out of the jail kind of setting which is not really where she needed to be yes she had committed drug crimes okay yeah she had but there was so much other things that were influencing the reason she did it this one person recognized we've got to get her out and get her help or she will end up killing herself or who knows what so she ended up in a safe house um, up in our general area, which is how I came to meet her. And while she was at the safe house, she got into counseling. Um, she got a plan where she could get her GED, where she took the parenting class, where she did several other things to actually help her, you know, progress to become an adult, to get custody of her child back, to hopefully, when she finished her sentence, would then be able to go on and live an actual life. And so the one person in the juvenile facility um, made a huge difference. And then, of course, getting her into the safe house, which um, the human trafficking or the organizations that fight human trafficking and provide safe houses um, are great models of actually trauma-informed care because they know they're dealing with highly traumatized individuals. And so they work it from every angle. And um, while still holding the people responsible for their actions moving forward. So there still was responsibility put on her, but it was not in a jail setting. Um, and it was not, she was no longer treated as a criminal, rather, but as someone who needed help and that who could be taught and could learn so that she could have better outcomes. And so um, it made a huge difference in her life and the life of her son whom she does now have custody of, and she's probably 19, between 19 and 20 years old now. So That's, that's a really good outcome of providing trauma-informed care. And one person, the, the role of one person and the impact they can yes. have in recognizing the adverse childhood experiences and how we can get somebody really to um, grow out of them and, and ultimately move on with their life. So, Thank you, Laurie, for that story, and we really appreciate the information on trauma-informed care. And what's uh, really critical is that we understand that this really can happen at the systemic level, at the environmental level. If all of us get to a stage where we are all trauma-informed, then it can actually impact a, on a larger basis and a more consistent basis with the clients we serve. So we provide you with some resources in the blog that would help you learn more about trauma-informed care. And last time on our video blog, we asked you a couple of questions to ponder, particularly one question was, how does um, the ACEs that you might have experienced yourself, if they have impacted your job? And um, in our next video blog, we're gonna talk about some self-care and to make sure that the ACEs that you might have experiences aren't impacting your job and therefore the service that you provide your clients. So come back and join us and thank you again.